I've spent over a dozen years now researching and creating what we call the nomad capitalist lifestyle. And along the way, I've spent many, many years working remotely. And so in this video, I'm going to share with you some of the takeaways that I've learned in over a decade of working while on the road. I'm Andrew Henderson. If you want to work with my team and I to create your own Nomad Capitalist strategy, you can learn how we do that at nomadcapitalist.com. And in this video, I'm going to share with you some of the hard-fought lessons that I've learned over years and years and years of working remotely. See, uh, when I first st started this process, I loved the idea of traveling nonstop. I started by living in the United States, and I was going and coming and going and coming all the time. I'd literally go to Europe, come back for four days, then catch another fare, go somewhere else, and I'd be constantly on the move. Eventually, I went to dragging a suitcase behind me for years, traveling all around the world, spending one month in a country, and then later spending as little as four or five days in a country before going on to the next place. And so lesson number one that I can tell you uh, that I've learned over the years is that travel does take a toll for a number of reasons. You know, remember the first flight I took as an adult. We traveled a lot as a family when I was young, but as an adult, my first big trip was to Norway. I went through a lot of effort and, you know, if you've ever... Uh, if you ever think back to when you started traveling, uh, you really got into that first trip. I think I planned that for almost a year, down to the detail of where I was going to go. I even learned some Norwegian because I was so excited about going and kind of connecting with part of my heritage. Uh, now, I mean, literally earlier this summer, uh, Mrs. H and I were taking a flight uh, from Belgrade back to our home, uh, our summer home in Montenegro. We're so uh, such veterans of this, we forgot to check in for the flight. They canceled our ticket, and we had to book a last-minute uh, business class ticket. It was very expensive. So, you know, the experience you're going to have with travel changes over time. And what I can tell you from my experience is you just start to notice the little things. You start to get annoyed with the airline. You start to get annoyed with how, oh, they changed the aircraft. Now your good seat is not very uh, good seat. Uh, you know, you start to get frustrated with hotels. I can tell you in over 2,000 nights of hotels, the entire veneer of hotels is gone. And now, for me, I just see a bunch of failed diplomats blathering and repeating every single line from their playbook. There's nothing sincere about it. And, you know, when you first stay at a hotel, uh, it's exciting, it's exquisite. Oh, you know, the Ritz-Carlton. Now I just, you know, I don't really enjoy it as much. And uh, I think that if you're going to be traveling and working remotely, you can either you know, jam all the excitement into an, uh, you know, earlier on, right? So if you travel more slowly, um, you know, if you take things more slowly, then you can prolong the excitement a little bit. If you've done what I've done, you know, after a decade plus, I'm just done for a while, right? I see all the little cracks in the system. And so understand that travel is going to eventually take a toll. One of the things that I've really been outspoken about in recent years that I think resonates with a lot of folks is I'm creating my trifecta. I'm creating three different homes that I want to live in, and in my case, possibly a couple of smaller business spaces and, and smaller homes that I enjoy. I want to travel between homes because why? Homes are a known commodity, okay? And that leads me to lesson number two. Your environment does play a role. Now, I know a lot of folks will say, Andrew, people don't stay at hotels anymore. They stay at Airbnbs, especially when they're doing long-term travel. And yes, I've stayed at Airbnbs. So while hotels have this kind of corporate diplomacy that I don't really get along with, the one thing I've liked about hotels, although I see actually a lot of hotels that aren't even doing this anymore, but the one thing I like about a great hotel, a legitimately five-star hotel, is the decor is there. Things are designed you know, it's almost like a focused group kind of interior decor where you feel productive. There's a nice smell in the lobby, right? You know, everything is nicely arranged. The bed is comfortable. There's a nice little desk you can work at. So if you find a nice hotel that legitimately has nice decor, it's comfortable, to me, that's a great place to work because you're not worried about, oh, this, this bed, you know, it hurts my back. Um, you know, you're not worried about, oh, there's a bad smell. For me, you know, I've stayed in some of the best Airbnbs. I mean, here in Mexico City, we decided to spend uh, five weeks. And I said, yeah, let's get a, an apartment. And we've looked for like one of the best apartments. And yet there's very little decor on the walls. I see big white walls. It's kind of depressing. There's these little, you know, kitschy knickknacks. Just, it's just not exactly what I'm looking for. It's not bad. I'm not uncomfortable there. But quite frankly, when you develop your own homes, for example, you do nicer art. You do all the touches that you want. In my experience, environment really plays a role. I have, I'm, I'm very sensory motivated in that 
you know, the environment is important. I think anyone who's going to be productive at the six, seven, eight figure entrepreneur level really needs some kind of environment. You know, if you're in an Airbnb where the Wi-Fi is kind of slow or, you know, the, the art is hanging off the wall in the wrong way, to me, I mean, as a details person, that kind of bothers me. So that brings me to the third lesson. Don't be cheap. Now, again, we're talking to the seven and the eight figure entrepreneurs. And so, you know, what I don't want you to do is to go out and to fall into the trap that I fell into early on, which is, oh, I'm going to Cambodia. It's a very affordable country. I should stay somewhere affordable. There's nothing wrong with going and staying at the Raffles Hotel and paying $200 a night or any number of other nice hotels in Cambodia or wherever you're going. I think the mistake that I made uh, many, many, many years ago was just not paying what I needed to pay to get what I needed. Again, creating a great environment where lesson four was respected. Lesson four, trusted commodities are important. Okay, Develop a list of trusted commodities. Again, this is why I like the idea of the trifecta where you have different homes that you control. You want to control your environment as much as possible. And so to do that, trusted environments are good. Several years ago, I was going to Columbia to do uh, some work on the ground there. And I had a great apartment. It had a beautiful kitchen. I mean, you, th this is perhaps the best uh, vacation rental. And it wasn't an Airbnb. It was from another site, actually. This was amazing. I mean, they had like every kind of paring knife. They had every kind of spoon for stirring soups. I mean, it was just every detail was accounted for. It's super rare thing. I was amazed by it. So I stayed there for a couple weeks. Then I went to Europe uh, to meet some folks. Then I came back. And so what did I do? My assistant found a place that was what? It was a little cheaper. And it was in a location that I kind of wanted to check out. So what did I do? I said, okay, try that place. We'll save a few bucks. I'll check out the other location. Terrible idea. I got there. Nothing like was represented. Felt super uncomfortable. Again, the environment was just really weird. You had to go up some really weird stairs. It just it was, it was bad. And so I, I called my assistant. It was like two in the morning for her. And I said, you got to get me into the other place. Call that other guy and, and see if he can get me into one of his uh, apartments in that building. And she was able to do so. I remember like, I was like, dude, thank you so much for getting me back in because it was so comfortable. So, you know, I, I, by the way, I'm going back and staying at that guy's apartment for three weeks uh, just after I leave Mexico City. And so you, know, you want to have a list of trusted uh, contacts. You want to have a list of trusted places, okay? One of the things that I found is, you know, you have so many options when you're living the nomad capitalist lifestyle. You can live anywhere in the world. You can do anything you want. You can, you can work whenever you want, and your hours are flexible. So many things are flexible. And when you have so much flexibility, you have to have some internal controls, or else it, things are just going to go wild. You know, too many options are just too many options. And so build your black book of places that you trust, and then go back there repeatedly. I've talked about that before for, you know, things like restaurants even. Um, you know, in a city like Mexico City, there's so many amazing restaurants. I tried a lot of restaurants, but I can tell you what, eventually I'm gonna have my little black book. I'm gonna go to the same number of places, whether it's five, 10, 20, or, or 50. I'm gonna go to those places and I'm gonna resist the urge to try so many new things because I wanna control my environment. I want to be able to know that wherever I'm going, I feel comfortable, I feel taken care of, I'm getting good service. To me, that's very important. Lesson number five is trust, but verify. What has been hard for me to understand in past years, and I think is just instinctively hard for a lot of us as human beings to understand, is other people's motivations. Understand that if you are working remotely, if you are traveling and living the nomad capitalist lifestyle, most people where you're from don't really understand that. Now, you know, we hear about the digital nomads in the media, they're always being talked about in you know, USA Today or the newspaper in Germany, whatever. But even then, a lot of people in those countries don't really understand it, you know, at a deep, soulful level. Imagine how they're not going to understand it in Nicaragua, okay? So, for example, one of the things that, that you need if you are sending emails and doing Skype calls and talking to your team and working online is you need to have great internet. Now, you might think, well, hey, it's, it's you know, we're in the 21st century. Internet is great. I can tell you this. Some of the best five-star hotels in the world have some of the worst internet. I remember talking to a gentleman. I was moving into my home uh, a couple years ago in Kuala Lumpur. I hadn't gotten the internet signed, uh, set up, so I had to go and spend a day in, in a hotel in the city center. Five-star hotel, great hotel. The general manager was nice enough when I asked about the Wi-Fi speed to say, you know, our company doesn't like to invest in Wi-Fi. They don't get it. I said, dude, it's not 1996 anymore where, you know, I would go with my family and my father would go on a business trip and, you know, 
Oh, yeah, okay, we, we, you can dial up, you know, you can get your internet. Today, internet's essential, but yet a lot of hotels don't realize that. And the hotels that you think would understand that they have wealthy business travelers, they don't understand it. Airbnbs, yeah, but here's the issue. I've stayed in apartments, I've stayed in hotels. The internet will go out. Maybe it goes out for an hour. And I'll be like, what's going on? I got things to do. They'll be like, hey, man, come on, it's just an hour, right? So understand that not everyone sees where you're coming from. They don't work online. They don't rely on email. They don't rely on Skype or whatever their online tools 24 hours a day. So it's very difficult for them to understand that you do. And so you really need to make sure that you're asking the right questions. You need to make sure that you're double and triple checking, which again is why I like having more control over my environments. I like having my own homes where I can control the internet. And if there's a problem, it's my fault and I can fix it. Uh, I like having a trusted uh, list of places because a lot of people just aren't going to understand what you need. And so whatever it is that you do need, make sure that you've, you've proceduralized that before you're traveling. You know, I create standard operating procedures for a lot of things in our company. And one of them is, uh, you know, what, what do we need when we're looking for a hotel? What do we need when we're looking for an apartment? When we're sending our team out on the road now to go and meet with people, you know, what do they need? Okay. Um, you might want to arrange things like, you know, uh, car services to pick you up from the airport or take you to important meetings because you may not be able to rely on Uber or Grab or whatever in any city. So understand the lay of the land and understand that, you know, people aren't going to be, they're not going to understand, well, hold on, I've got this important business to meeting to go to. Why is Uber taking so long? You know, it's just not within their purview and that's okay. Lesson number six is don't be afraid to get off the beaten path. I feel that I've built a lot of great relationships um, both in business and personally, by going places that a lot of other people don't go uh, as part of this nomad scene. So, you know, Kuala Lumpur, where I spend part of my year, is one example of a place that, to me, is overlooked by a lot of people uh, who live a nomadic lifestyle. People go to Thailand, they go to Bali, and those places are fine. But to me, as a business person, I meet a lot more business contacts for the stuff that I'm trying to do in a place like Malaysia. And so, where others zig, I like to zag. I don't want to be a contrarian just to be a contrarian, but I do think if you're going places that haven't been explored, uh, that's a good thing. You know, I can tell you this, you know, we start, I started talking about Georgia five years ago. Now I see a lot of people coming to Georgia, yet five years ago, nobody was going there. You wouldn't even be talking about Georgia if it weren't for me, okay? So, you know, places are not going to stay hidden for long. I mean, what I see is more and more people going to more and more places. More and more countries are opening up. And so, you know, eventually everyone will be going everywhere. But what I like to do is be a little bit contrarian, go places that others aren't going. You know, people say, hey, alcohol's too expensive in Kuala Lumpur. That's where I'm going because I'm going to be able to meet a broader spectrum of people and be able to get out of the nomadic bubble. So those are six lessons that I've learned over a decade of traveling and working while I'm doing it. If you have a suggestion that you think I missed or you want to expand on one of these suggestions, leave a comment below because I want to hear your experiences too. Hi, I'm Andrew Henderson from Nomad Capitalist. I wrote this book, which you can find on Amazon, to distill a lot of the stuff we talk about in these videos and a lot of the stuff I've learned over the last decade plus traveling all around the world, teaching you about how to legally reduce your taxes, build your personal freedom, and create wealth faster. Definitely get a copy of this book if you want to learn more. Now, if you want to watch more videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel and make sure you click the notifications bell so you never miss one of our new videos with more tips on how to go where you're treated best. And if you're already a six or seven figure entrepreneur and you'd like to put these strategies in place for yourself, go to nomadcapitalist.com and learn about how I can help you.